I want to welcome all of you and those of you who are viewing the, this seminar online, perhaps at a later date, uh, to this very important MediaX seminar. MediaX is a membership organization and we face industry and look to the future uh, with problems that businesses are facing at the intersection of human sciences and information technology. And we are a bridge to the academic community at Stanford where studies involving human sciences and information technology take place. So at the intersection of people and information technology, a lot goes on. Much of it is media related, but some of it is also health, some of it is law. And MediaX um, encompasses all of those I issues uh, as they are of interest both to the university and to the business community especially with education, with entertainment, and with commerce. Now, frequently I hear people from the business community uh, asking the question, what is big data? What can we do with it? How should we think about it? How can we harness it? Where is the potential in big data to add value to our companies? In many of those conversations, the solution becomes thinking about the smart data. And out of all of the data, finding the data that is the most compelling, the most predictive, uh, the most uh, influential, instrumental that can be used. Uh, that's not an easy task. Uh, it, was, it certainly has been a task that has been addressed by a number of scientific fields in which big data is, uh, has been around for quite some time. And, and we have in the audience today from civil engineering, journalism, from uh, geological sciences, uh, people who are familiar with the problem of analyzing massive quantities of data in order to find the right insights. Well, today we are going to spring, we are going to liberate uh, some concepts that have de been developed in the physics community and turn them loose on all of the other potential applications that they might have in uh, environmental engineering, in astronomy, in geological sciences, in human-facing uh, personalized information systems. Uh, the potential is in our imaginations to, um, to create, um, to adapt, to transfer, as it were, some uh, knowledge that has been developed at the Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, Center here at Stanford University. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Martin Lee, who is uh, a physicist and a computer scientist who has been the developer of uh, algorithms that have accomplished what might have seemed impossible some years ago. To, in an instrument that's a mile long, create the algorithms that would allow subatomic particles to be shot one mile away and reach their target. The precision required for that is, was at one time unfathomable. Today it has uh, been very ably realized and many discoveries have come from it. Uh, Dr. Lee is a MediaX Distinguished Visiting Scholar and I'm very pleased to introduce him to you to uh, talk about uh, the uh, finding the deep well with a cold start. Martin. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you an outline. So there'll be introduction, and then a, the first, next one is on iMigo. There's many names because in 15 years, names got changed. So there's something called iMigo. And uh, then, then later on, go to iMigo, change again, and change to Acorn, and finally it's called Acorn Magic. And that's enough to tell you it's going to be a whole bag full. Uh, but don't worry, we'll, we'll try to sail through them all. And then I'm going to give you another name, Oasis, in a minute. So. There's just a whole bunch of names. This is kind of how it happened in 15 years. It took just 15 years to come up with all this. And one is, uh, one is on top of the other. Okay. So finally, I could give you the last name, Acorn Magic in the Box. And that's where Martha was talking about. And that box is going to be used for 
something I call man-machine learning. It's, it isn't just man, it isn't machine. Most people up to now have been thinking we should be one or the other, and I want to introduce a hybrid approach. I happen to drive a Prius, so I know how good that is. Uh, so introduction, well, I love this name. Uh, Jason here made up the name, I kept it. Uh, and uh, So first thing is, optimization has been around for, for a long time. Lots of people work on it. Stanford has optimization laboratory called System Optimization Lab, well known. And they do optimization just like this. So when you want to do something, you got to think out of the box. If it's, otherwise, you won't get anything new. So that's the first question I ask. How do I think out of the box? Well, what I do is you look at what is already known. Everybody knows how to solve nonlinear equation linearly. You learned that in school. You learn, you, this, everybody knows that. For, and, uh, but then the question I ask myself is, can you do the other way? Solving linear equation nonlinearly. It's a fair question. Can you come up with an algorithm and you do a linear problem? You have to do it nonlinearly and get the answer. And uh, that sounds kind of funny, but that's what I ask. So the next thing I, I look at what's out there is linear programming. Everybody do that. That's a matrix equation put in the computer. And you know, matrix are big, so they use different tricks. And they call them linear program. There's different options on that. I'm sure you know all that. And, uh, but then I ask myself out of the bo box at this question, nonlinear programming. Can you still use matrix algebra? Something that already worked, everybody knows. Why throw it away? It would be nice if we could do that. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. So I think seeing is believing. And I'll let you start this talk, uh, continue this talk by showing you the movie first. I want you to see it so you know what I'm talking about. And then, then we continue. Th th this program I I'm going to show you. Uh, it's in MATLAB, so those of you who know MATLAB, you're familiar with the, uh, what the files look like. So this is a run file, you'll show you a bunch of movies. I'm going to walk you through them, and then after that you'll see what I'm talking about. It goes very fast, so i show it to you a few times. Okay, now I'm going to go through it slowly so you can see what's going on here. But you see there's a dot rolling around, and eventually hit the, hit the middle of the blue circle. Well, these, these plots are called contour plots. And this contour plot, you can only make contour plot with two variables. Suppose you have a system only have two variables, but it's very nonlinear. And you have something called a target function. And the target function looks like a surface uh, that you see here. Looks like that. So in this particular problem, it's a very well-known nonlinear optimization problem posted in Google. I don't know where it's, I got it, but 15 years ago, it was all over the place. And it says, if you want to know how good your algorithm is, try this one. If you can't solve this one, then it's no good. So I've been using that for 15 years. Every time I make a change, I make sure it still works. So I'm sharing this with you. And then, in fact, uh, eventually, we're going to give you a, a, a MATLAB file that could, you could play this movie. And that's kind of cool. Um, OK, so, so here's the objective function, uh, the target function. You want to minimize. And you have two variables, one and two. And then the question is, depending on where you start, can you always find the minimum? And all the programs that you know of, I know of, uh, are doing something like that, very similar. And that's called constraint optimization. Constraint means you, you, you don't look at infinite range. You look at uh, within a range of, of these two, two, look inside a square area. And then you look at contour plot of the, of the, uh, of the, 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 the objective function, then you see these, uh, these lines. So this look like a pit, and the brown one look like the, the uh, this is the, the valley, and the brown one is the pit, the, the peak. And, and the program actually looks for different solutions, not just the, the, um, the global one, namely, you start with here, and it finds the one in there. So that's a global min. Okay? But then it also looks for the other ones too. And that program works after you look at all, all of them, so you know all the minimums, and look at the one with the lowest objective function, that's your answer. The good part about the algorithm that we have is, is that no matter how many variables you have, 
this display still work, except that you can plot them, that's all. I'll tell you something else you could plot. There's also 2D. To, to, to this work, to this convergence, can depend on where you start. You need the two parameter to wiggle yourself into the hole. And that's called the control convergence parameter. And uh, I, will, I will show it to you later. OK, so let's, let's look at this movie again, but in the reverse order. Let me show you something that you don't get into the hole, the global man, and start one by one. So that was kind of a punchline. I show it to you first, but really, let's look at this slowly. OK. Here's another movie. And this movie shows you start out always in the middle. And you try to hit really there. The, remember I said there's two parameters, one called R and P. And when you adjust them right, it'll go to the global mean. But most time, you don't know what it is. So you have to search for them. And just make some guesses. Then it'll go to the, either the peak, that's what this one is, or go to the minimum, that's the one inside the blue. In this particular pair, search parameter R and P, uh, you go to the peak. So R stands for roots, P stands for path. So this program used to be called Oasis Pathfinder. And that's what, what it's based on. The work I did at Slack start with Oasis Pathfinder. And you have to find a path that, with the, with the, that give you all the roots. So there's two parameters, R and P. So when I say R means root, P means path. And every given R and P pair get you one of the solution, either at the peak or the valley, depending on uh, what RMP is. The reason it goes there, because the way I construct the program, just like everybody else, you take the derivative of the objective function and look for where it's zero. So you can find solution that is either a maximum or minimum or shallow point. So this we all know. All right, let me show you some more. Here's another case. Same point starting, changing R and P gets you to a shadow point. Okay, that's how uh, Oasis work, and uh, and then another case. So you could play this game all day. It's kind of fun. Uh, I, I used to play all the time, and this this R and P get it to you to a local minimum. OK, so you know, want to know what that is? You look at this picture again. It hits that local minimum, starting in the middle, roll down the hill, and didn't go. So most program, I'll, I'll, we have up to the time that I start working on it, it depends on where you start. You start near that local min, you go to the lo local min. Uh, it's called basin attraction. It sucks it in. And it, the program we have now, before I work on it, Never could get out of this basin attraction. So it's limited in use. That's the problem I try to address. And as I showed you already, the one I showed you earlier, which is kind of the punchline of all this, is let me show it to you again. You get the right R and P, then you roll them in. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so what kind of algorithm is this? It's chaotic. It's nonlinear. Look at that. And how nonlinear is this? Well, I'll show you more curve. Uh, take this away. That's the same surface. And how nonlinear is that? Well, look at that. It turns out the, the program are actually adaptive. The R changes every step. It knows smart enough to know how to adjust its own R. You give a starting value, and it's smart enough to take all this wiggle. And you want to come out. So this is a variation of R along the steps. You first go up, and then go to side, and then come back here, and then go, go back to zero. And convergence depends on the end while you are. If R goes to zero at the end, you got it made. But they don't know where it is. Could be a min, a max, or shallow point. But that's all right. If you could have all the time in the world, you look at them all, you look at the one that you really want, the lowest one. So that's why we call it looking for you know, the, the well, the deepest well. OK, that's where the name comes from. And, and what's the variation of objective function along this path? In this case, it grew up. 
and then eventually dive down, and then uh, finally settle down to the bottom. And this is log scale. At this scale, you can see. I, I, I sometimes part of log scale you can see, but this is like 10 to the minus a or something when it's down there. So it really wiggles around. All right. So enough of that. Let's go back to the lecture. Well, we cover thinking. Uh, we already done that. Then, uh, uh, and, and now we go to the next thing. I'm going to really tell you <coughs> how it's done. Show you a little math because the the, the, the lecture is about math in Acorn. Acorn is going to be at the end, but then to get to it, let's do the math for Oasis. And then uh, in this part, I'm going to talk about how to go from Oasis to Amigo. The difference between Oasis and Amigo is uh, Oasis is a, a set of equation solver. Amigo is optimization program. It's a little different if you are like you're in this field. So just they are different because. When you solve equations, that's one thing. When you optimize the functions, it's another thing. But at the end, I'll show you the same algorithm will work. Just the, the, uh, the use of OASIS for optimization program is called Amigo. And uh, the GO stands for Global Optimal. Hopefully, you get the YNR and P in and you'll get it. And that's what you saw in the movie. It's done by Amigo. OK, so well, when I work at Slack, I invented something called Oasis Pathfinder, which I will explain to you now. And then also, uh, you see how it is. So the idea came not all at once, but there's different idea. Thinking out of the box, you kind of go meditation or something. And then the idea comes in, and you grab it. So the first idea is, I like to transform a set of equations. Remember Oasis equation software? I want to put it into a matrix equation. How could I do that? Well, I'll show you. So here's the set equation. M equation, M unknown. I mean, you have to have square, you know, M equation, M unknown. And F is the equation, and uh, unknowns are X. I normalize everything to 1. That is a standard form. Normally, you find roots, you should make them 0, but that's OK. We can make them 1, they still find it. You call that roots. So the root finder refers to the root of this equation. Part is how do you get there. Given a starting condition, how do you get there? No matter how many variables you have, you could be having now they talk big data. I have talked to people that have a million variables, and they ask me, "Can you do it?" I said, "I could do it. It's just you don't have enough time to do it." But then I show you there might be a way we could do it now. That was a year ago, so things are really fast. I mean, a year time, everything moved. I cannot believe how fast it is. So how do you put that into a matrix form, and let x be the variable instead of a that I represent it with a with a vector, and I want all that be one, and I want to f can I put that set of equation into a matrix form? Well, if you think out of the box, you can. So here's what happened. So the F you can see everywhere, diagonally they all look the same with the index change. Okay, and uh, you see that, and then these off diagonal are very similar, but you multiply it together. You get back that. Uh, you could check it. It's easy. Because when you multiply it, the denominator goes away. Because the x times uh, the x get rid of them. So when you add them up, how many f cancels out? That's what m minus 1 is. Because that's m minus 1 of the inner elements. And you get back with f. So it's very easy arithmetic to check. But to get that takes some imagination. Trust me. you got to think out of the box. And you want to read it? It's in that report. And you could download them. OK, second idea. Now I've got matrix. Can I invert it? I mean, linear algebra, right? Matrix algebra. Inverting, they do all the time. Why could I do it? So I say, well, let's try. So invert it. You give you m, you just invert m. You did that in linear algebra. And I say, hmm, let me try this. And then, lo and behold, here comes the answer. It's inverted analytically. It looks just like the other one. Except the f's in the bottom, the x is kind of flipped upside down and stuff like that. But it looks the same, uh, similar. You got lots of things diagonally and a few same kind of looking term horizontally uh, by row. Anyway, if you multiply the two together, you get an identity matrix. Go home, you check it out. Okay? And also, you can read it in my report. Now, with these two ideas, I say, oh, now I got a A. Now I'm into the world of mathematics. 
no more computer, no more none of that. I could do math. I could use all I know in linear algebra, in matrix algebra, to do this because it's nothing but manipulating matrices. Okay, so there. Let's continue. Then I look at that a little bit. I recognize something. And if, if everybody knows the matrix time is inverse, it's identity matrix. And if I take this equation, this expression t, this, this thing multiplied together, get something called t. And what do I have? I got that. You can check it out too. You take m minus one I gave you on the previous slide and the one before that, m, multiply them together, and you get that. Go home and check it. Of course, I still do a little shorthand. Instead of F, I call it G. I'll tell you what G look like next, in our next slide. But what's important for you to see right now is it is identity. X, the last equation, equal T times X. It's an identity matrix. No matter what X is, it's always true. And the T matrix has both F, or one over F is G, has both G and X in it. But G is one over F, F is function of X, so T matrix is not a simple thing, not a constant like algebra, okay? But it's a function of F. In fact, function of G, one over F. And G is a function of X, so it's a function of X too. But it's also a function of R, because the M has a uh, function of R. You see that? R is everywhere. So that's why R is called root control parameter. When you change R, you get different roots. It's built into this equation, built into T. Very cool. When I saw that, I was extremely happy. Then I had to learn programming, and I learned MATLAB. Last time I programmed was years ago. I used Fortran. I used to walk around the world with a box of cards. And to learn MATLAB was quite a chore. I learned enough to, to do this problem. So when the program I'm going to share with you is written by me and with a few other people's help. And it is uh, written by Nayo. <laughs> so don't, don't be too critical, but it works. And I, that's how much programming I want to do. Uh, I love my programming, it's hard. Uh, okay, so what you got there, this thing, is if you do it turn by turn, you know, I'll show it to you, and you get something interesting out of that. So what's interesting is, is if, the, if you look at the, the, the expression turn by turn, you multiply, you get the first one, first diagonal one, this one, with times x1. This one times x2, you multiply by x out here. And each one is, pick out it, the x corresponding to x2. x on, on the left hand side corresponding to the x on the right hand side. You multiply them out, and you get just this equation. The second one, y under rn equal iteration, that's the equation. You multiply out. And the k refers to the corresponding x. And it's very cool because the g is 1 over x, as I said to you. Just definition, make it shorter to write. g0 is the average of g over the number variable. OK? And they both are function of x. And x, if you know x, you could compute using this formula, compute the next x. That's how you use it to, from the identity. If the x were equal, then it's identity. But if you put any O x in it, then it won't work because this thing is dependent on x too. And uh, so you need to put the right thing into it. When you get convergence of all these things for m of those, then you got convergence. OK, so let me, so what I say is this. You put x into here and get another x. So you do it iteratively. And at the end, if all the x you get don't change, you get convergence. And that's controlled by the r value you pick. And you can see it in this equation. All right. OK, so that's the OASIS formula. <coughs> and you know we're solving a set of equations, so you got f, where it's just whatever you got. OK, later on I will show you how to change it to optimization program by just changing f. Everything looked the same. So that's it. what I'm going to say next is uh, how do you change from equations over to optimizer? Optimizer, and here's what you do. Here's the equation you just saw. I just turn it backward, and uh, and you put x into there, and crank out with that formula. 
and you got x, you got the output. And you do it, and then put the output back into the input. But before you do it, you need g, otherwise it won't work. So here, you need to find g. So how do you find g? That's how you do it. You get from the x, you put it into the lower box, and the arrow inside the box is the direction of the flow. And then you get g. So g is for the next iteration. Once you get g, what do you do with it? Well, you put it back, so you get both x and g. And now you start over again. To run this, you need an initial condition, namely the initial value of x, as I saw, show you in the movie. In the movie, it's always in the middle. It's just graphically convenient. All right, so like all the other algorithm, you need an initial condition, you need an initial value, and you hope the thing converges. You hope the conversion gives you the right answer, and you don't get the right answer, then you're stuck. Well, I've been stuck all my life, running all these programs that I have. So I want one that won't get me stuck. Okay, so convergence means now the x converges, g converges, because they're function of x. And when you do that, you stop this process. And then you want to change to uh, Amigo, to an optimizer. The set of function, the set equation really is a partial derivative of an objective function. You know when objective function goes to zero, uh, but then you add one to it to make it look like the same, you know. Anyway, you need to do something on that, but that's a uh, definition. Uh, once you have that, then the same OASIS will work for optimization, and we call that IMIGO. And the reason called IMIGO is IMI stands for inverse matrix identity that I showed you earlier, and it's global optimization. So today we talk about optimization. From now on, you, you're going to just stay with optimization, forget about equations, until the end. At the end, I'm going to go back to the equation, and it still works, and that's going to be ACORN. ACORN will be, first you go from OASIS, set the equation solver, then you go to optimization program, we call IMIGO GO, when you see, okay? When you see GO, it means optimization or program with an O. <coughs> and then eventually at the end of the lecture, you see ACORN. And ACORN, go back to the equation solver, no O's. Very cool. And the reason why it's good, because it takes time to compute. Anytime you take derivative, it takes time. When you get a million variable, you don't want to do that. A million x. So you gotta do be smart. So I eventually go to ACON. But everything is the same. Just as you've seen already, Oasis, Amigo is the same. Okay. But then before you use this, there's always something you have to do. You gotta prepare the coordinate system. And to prepare the you gotta make sure they're bounded. That's where the constraint comes in. And then there's something that I learned uh, from the jargon that everybody used. It's called Jacobian, Hessian, all that stuff. And that's nothing but a second derivative of the objective function, that's the Hessian. And the, and the other one, first derivative is the Jacobian. So all these smart guys all play with this already. So, but then one thing that I borrow from them is something called eigenvalue decomposition. So given a matrix, I'm talking about matrix, okay? The Hessian is nothing but matrix, so you could decompose into three matrices. The middle one's called eigenvalue, and the other two are, are vectors. Uh, everybody knows that in linear algebra. <coughs> and uh, the trick about this is using this as a coordinate transformation enable me to introduce another parameter. It's all described in my report, so you could look at that. And what it does is J is for Jacobian, and you can see that where P comes in. So if I do something called uh, um, eigenvalue decomposition at the initial point to change the coordinate system. In doing that, I introduce another parameter called P. P is called a path control parameter. Different P gets me a different solution. So I need both R and P. Only two, no matter how many X you have. And that's really the beauty because you could have, once you get to work on two dimensions, you know the thing will work for any number of variables. So big size, go away. We treat big things like small things. That's really cool. I mean, I heard a lecture the other day, somebody say, the hardest thing right now is called something called P equal to LP. Well, I think this is like P equal to LP. No matter how big you are. Well, small problem, there's no P would equal LP. Of course, obviously. But big problem, people start to wonder. This is for the expert. And I heard that, and I said, this is P equal to LP. Because I take something big, it doesn't matter. I look at it just like the same, two-dimensional problem. And the only price you pay is the speed. Okay, so from now on, robustness is out of the question. 
most programs out there are not robust because depending on where you start, you could get stuck on a local min, not robust. And this Amigo here is robust because it enables you to get all the max and min and shadow point, and then you choose the one you call global min. And the matter is just searching over 2D, namely R and P. And when you change the number of variables, the same thing still works. Okay, keep that in mind, then I think we're in the church. So we iterate it, it just tells you uh, you need to search. It's always 2D, no matter how many uh, variables you have. They're independent of size. So now I'm going to look for how you're going to look for a, 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 a deep well from a cold start, namely the example I show you. When you're so far away from the global mean, and you know the all kind of local mean around where you are, how are you going to go from there? Yeah. So that's called a cold start. You may have guessed where it might be. And how do you do it automatically? So you're adding the, the, the word A in front of in front of Amigo, change the word to aim I go. It's just automated Amigo. And when you automate it, that means you have an algorithm that enables you to search for RMP automatically. That's all. But that takes a while. I mean, it's 15 years it took to do all this, so I don't know how many years it took that. So as I said before, depending on what RMP you get, you could have end up in different places. And the idea you want to get RMP to go into there, you want to do it automatically, and how you do that is, is what I'm going to tell you. So how do you go from Amigo to aim I go? Yeah, you're going to get a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. You don't need to worry. Yeah, everything is uh, Jason could take care. Okay, here goes the proof of it. I won't go through because it's, you could read it, but the idea is, is some simple. The whole algorithm depends on conversion to G zero, the average value of G. And the, the G sort of spread around G0. You can make G0 converges. You know these guys are going to converge with it. Because sooner or later, someone's going to hit the, hit the boundary before others. Like taking a sausage, and the, the skin of the sausage will touch that and, this, and converge already. So the, the sausage shrinks as it goes. Can't help it. And that's why I could control it with RMP only. Because uh, no matter how, how many variables I have, that's how big the sausage is how many things in it. But some of them would converge, and when I push the average convert, they all converge. So, and different RMP goes to different solution. Okay, so now I want to show you a picture of what it looked like around the global min. So you scan RMP and look at objective function from the same start point, you get a well. See the well? Looks like a bird, but, the, but it's a well. Okay, the, the blue one is the, low, the pit. And for the problem you just saw earlier in the movie, there's a whole range of RMP within a, a space that all goes in. So it's not one RMP goes into the pit, a lot of RMP goes into the pit. In fact, over an area RMP. So searching for RMP is not a, as difficult as it is. It's not a single value RMP. It's a, a bundle of RMP that will work. It takes all the solution, all the path, and bundles them, and send it down the pit. This display is universal. It's independent of the size of the, the problem. You got a million variable, you want to see what the well look like, just look at this. So man machine interface is soft. It's a very good display. I have never seen any display so nice in optimization program. And now once I see this, I named this program, name it. People ask me, what, what is this thing? I say, that's a peace bird. In, in Japanese thing, they have this folding paper and they hang them on the tree. Well, it looks like to me that. So I may go, why is it a peace bird? I say, well, if you're a philosopher, the, the meditation is supposed to think about how am I or who am I? And I get an answer for that. I am I. And anyway, that's the kind of the, where the name comes from. I am I go, and then you get it. All right. Uh, I was going to show a movie here, but I already did it earlier, so you don't see movie anymore. Uh, so what you have to, what we did from iMigo to amigo is just to making the search uh, automatic and able to get a curve like that out. Normally, when I run a two-dimension problem, it's slow. This thing, this problem, two variables. Doesn't matter how many variables you have, still take the same amount of time to search. 
to search for not this, but over the whole big, to get all the solution that you saw in the plot. Took night time to run. And my friend works for me, and he coded it up. I said, God, I only go run at night. Oh, I want it now. I want it when I go get some coffee or tea or something. Come back, I want to see this. So I could see, you know, who want to wear a day? So that began the next round of research. How do you go that? How do you do that? How do you make it fast? Now we've got robustness under control. How do you make it fast? How do you get this curve just like that? And the only time you compute is just a, the objective function. And you don't want to take derivative. You take derivative, it takes too long. So that got me thinking. Again, I have to be outside the box. Having thought for outside the box a while, then I got the, the, the way to do it, and I will show it to you. That's ACON. Okay, so I'm going to tell you ACON. And the ACON, I, I wanted that because I, I'm into something called machine learning and inverse design, data mining. And as Martha is saying earlier, so later, I sh if you have time, I'll give you some example. But right now, let's just uh, continue. So, how, how do you do ACON? Well, ACON is going to be something new. We end up with A micro now, and the next layer is ACON. With ACON, I want to be fast. We got the robustness, but we want to be fast and robust. So first, I show you why we talk about big, 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 big data and all that. Because if it's small data, who cares, right? You have a big data, big problem, millions of variable, and uh, and uh, years of data. What are you going to do with that? Well, Slack has some. Slack is a colliding agreement experiment, a uh, long one. That's two miles long, the straight line. I started in 1962, spent 48 years. We tried try once, and um, and then I I start with the Linux, and I see a lot of big data because when you do co experiments, you collect a lot of data. So there's a lot of data to control this thing. There's a big optimization to design it in this inverse design. So I did some co thing called Spear. It's a small storage ring back in the 70s, and Spear is an interesting thing because it's the first time it's ever been built in the world, first of its kind, and. Uh, it got no, three Nobel Prizes from the experiment done there. So I'm honored that I work on the lattice. A lattice means, you know, you have a machine, these are accelerators. What's the lattice mean? Well, if you look inside the tunnel, this, this is the housing. Tunnel's underground, so you don't see it. But, and, and, but if you go into the tunnel, you see lots of magnets. And they're sitting, you know, in different positions and powered by different things. And the whole tunnel is full of wires. and machines and all kinds of stuff. So it's not, uh, you don't see that, that's always very complex. It's a big problem. It's a big inverse design problem. You want every magnet to be right, everyone is power correctly, you want to know what tolerance to run them. Yeah, if things don't work, you want to figure out how, why. Look up a CERN. CERN has a missile in now 35 miles circumference. They use the same technique that I invented as Spear to make CERN work. And I learned all that from doing Spear. So, uh, and Spear sits on a parking lot, actually. And so you could actually walk in and no need to go in the tunnel. Uh, my thesis advisor is, I got my PhD from Stanford, and my thesis advisor is uh, Bert Richter. He got his Nobel Prize uh, uh, 40 years ago. I just went to his re uh, celebration party. And I'm honored to be invited because uh, all the people there are a part of the author on the paper where he discovered a side particle. And, and uh, three or four of us are machine builders. And I'm honored that he, he invited us and my wife. And that was taken just a few months ago. Uh, so, okay, so there is Spear and, uh, and lots of experimental data to analyze. And then nowadays, you look around, there's a whole bunch of them in the world, and they're big. So Spear becomes this size. And this machine co costs up to a billion dollars. It's a big machine. So we don't have the biggest one here, Slack. We still have Spear. But Spear is almighty, still working. Uh, so Spear is just that baby. And, uh, and it, we now no longer colliding beam. Spear, when it first built, is colliding electron and positron in the same ring. And that's when I was working on it. And eventually, I helped to convert Spear into single time radiation lab. Because whenever you bend a, a particle electrons, they radiate. And the single radiation is very well controlled, so you could 
study materials with them. And uh, nowadays used everywhere, that's why so many. And this big one, there's five of those. The one I show you on top here is Spring 8. And the other one I think is in somewhere. And these are big data machines. Because when you hit material with the x-ray, you get all kinds of pictures. There are two dimensions. There's just intensity versus uh, wherever the dots are. And you want to fold them back to look at 3D. So at Spear, we actually was the first one that looked at the, the structure of DNA that way. Very cool work. Big data, big data. And now uh, data problem of this size has a one million variable. And I said, don't worry. I'm eager to eat that. Now I get Acorn. I'm tempted to go back and say, don't worry. Maybe Acorn could do it. I'll show you the possibility. I mean, this is dream, so I, so I, I, you have to just follow my. But what's good about dreams, that It gives you more thesis problem to work on. It gives you more jobs. So the rest of the talk is my dream, to hope that through this work, we create something. More thesis, more jobs, and that's what it's all about. Now, they, they did a comparison of, of Acorn with uh, Amigo and all that. And then it turns out they say that Acorn's the only one, that Slack, this is doing it, Acorn's the only one that, uh, that's uh, robust and is fast because it doesn't take positive solution. And robust because you could go from a cold start and get there and you get all the solutions. Okay, now, just to show you cold start. You couldn't get more colder than this. You're right next to the initial eye in the middle of the plot. You're right next to the, to, to that, to the pit. Any program will fall in. Even Amigo falls in. But Acorn does not. It doesn't take to root it. If you're thinking about steepest descent, it doesn't know what descent is, no to root it. Never touch it. So it's smart enough to not get too hot. And why people think about steepest descent? Because there's a box. You think outside the box, then you say, no derivative. And then, look at what happened. Wham. It takes a while to get in there. I, I, I wish I had time to show you this movie. But anyway, I'll show you another one. That's called cold start, right? Really cold. It's not how far you are from it. It's how close you are to the local men. It's like the black hole, you know? You get sucked in. Now, this one is more interesting. It starts going toward the local mean on the, on the right upper corner, where, where the words come out. But it's robust enough, it takes a turn and go to the global mean. Isn't that clever? How could anybody do that? Well, Acorn does that. Now, I can't share with you Acorn because Acorn is something I've done since I retired. And it's, uh, I need lots of help to, to get program converted and on and on. And since there's people helping me, I have to keep it proprietary right now. And eventually, but you could play with Amigo, same, because look the same. Look, the curve look no, no different, movies look different, and you could play with this once I give you uh, the program. Okay, so now what's the possible uh, application of Acorn once you have it? Well, Martha is talking about big data. Martha is talking about uh, the good big data. You want, to you want to fish out what's really meaningful. And there's nothing more meaningful when you get beta, is to ask the question, what's the correlation between the data? What goes with what? Big data, big correlation too, hard, lots of them. And I happen to like neural network because if you look at the inside what's here, it's all neural networks anyway. And we make, call, we decide what correlate with what, usually use this. So neural networks seem to be the way to do it. But neural network has one problem. If you don't get an optimized neural network, then how do you know? You know, it's the best you could do. So you gotta optimize the configuration of neural network. At the same time, you have to determine for each neural network what the optimal ways you know, to fit the data. We all know that. So this is a very complicated thing. And I said, that's a good way to fish out meaningful data. And so you have a, a process to be modeled, lots of data on the bottom, and then top is uh, new network, try to capture that. And then you some, some one set of data called V, and another set of data called U. So these are major data. 
and you want to make sure that uh, study how they call it, if you get a neural network to represent input and output relationship, then you got it. If they're not related, it won't be there. So neural network is a way to capture it. But you have to know what goes to the left, what goes to the right. That's up to you. On the left, it's really the independent variable. On the right, it's dependent. So you have a domain expert. You got to do some thinking. And you come up with what you decide as the input, what you decide output. And then you get a lot, as much data as you want and make the neural network configuration, make a change to, and then look for the way each time. That's when you need ACORN. OK? So ACORN put the prediction for the same input, and it depends on the value of W, which is the weight of the neural network. Now, if you Google where you find what weights are, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a bunch of functions, nonlinear, oh man, and a lot of them too. So all right, that's what's going on in the brain. And then when you want to do the brain thing, you got to write an objective function. Objective function is nothing but the least square difference between the measurement and the prediction for the same input. Okay, And then you've got to find out the W that, that makes it minimize. So minimize the difference between the prediction from neural network and the measure data for the same input data and go through all the inputs and sum them all up. And now that's what the objective function is. So I hope by now you see what the objective function look like. But you can use this for solving equation too, by the way. Because if the, the number of uh, data set is the same as, uh, as, as the number of variables, then it's so this, just uh, what I said. Now you could use the optimization program and solve equations just the same. OK. So these are just more tricks, dependent in different variable in the way, just to remind you. All right, so this, I, I like to work on this. I have some experience with it. And this is where I'm going with my software, ACON. So now, what is about ACON magic? Ah, that's to get speed. You need magic when you're speed. So how do you get speed? Well, what do you do these days? Put it in the cluster. So how do you do that? Well, watch this. You put one ACON, two ACON, three ACON, four. Put a bunch of them, right? And you and it's in order to get super speed, super sure enough, that's that's uh, super security. Put in the cluster in the cloud you want, simple, shareable, all that, and then you put in the in the cluster. Well, this is old. Now it's old. When I had it, it was new a few years back, and the cluster will look like that. But now we're talking about desktop. <laughs> this is only a hundred. 100 microprocessor and looks, they got air conditioning and cool. It wasn't long ago. And they let me put my stuff in there. Huh. I think that's fine. It was a really speed things up because my algorithm does take derivatives, so the time computing goes linearly with the number variable. Other than non linearly, maybe square. Okay, so that's one gain. Second gain is uh, you could parallel process. Because each RMP could run independent of the other RMP. They, there's no synchronicity problem. Really simple. And they all start and end at the same time. So it makes getting the Amigo bird easy, getting the pit easy, the deep well. So I liked it. Uh, and I say, OK, well, we got, that's the way you do it. You want security, put it in the cloud. But then nowadays, maybe cloud, you don't need it. They got this desktop uh, computer. So, and now with the desktop computer, you got super fast and robust. And so I just want to share that with you. OK. And uh, now we look ahead. Looking ahead, what do we see is acorn in the box. Instead of putting it in this big room, you have it on your table. When I first started, you know, I had a computer called Next. You remember the Next? One program goes in the Next. <laughs> <laughs> you could put a <laughs> hundred of these in one next. So, <laughs> okay. So now, how do you do that? Well, you put in the a next like that one. Well, this is not a next, but it's same size, you know. Okay. Now this machine is very special to me. It's my next cube. Host. It was the first one that got the email from CERN to Slack, 1991. It's in Slack archive. I recommend taking the Smithsonian. I wish it's mine. I could sell it. But it's Stanford's. 
Okay. And the reason why uh, my 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 index was not being used much. Only one one program, the one I wrote. Other people are using all kinds of things, analyzing this and that. They're busy. So when they asked me, can we use it for your server? I didn't even know what it was. I said, sure. <laughs> I'm glad I said yes. OK, so now if you put a, a new process, new computer parallel process and in, in a box like that, then there will be the next home. That's the box for future magic. And now you could do something I call machine man joint learning for inverse design and evaluative analysis. Don't let the machine do it all. And don't do it yourself, do it all. Build a Prius. Mix them. So that's, that's what Acorn Magic in the Box is. And then I've been very lucky. I used to call them different names. So at, at one time, I called them uh, by that name. And, and that's named after a dear friend of mine. And his initial happened to be uh, JL. So that's what MJL stands for, Martin and Cha Ling. And it wasn't MJL. MJL is new because I didn't have the box then. With the box, I changed the acronym. And now it's, it's called Machine Man Joint Learning. And this is a dear friend who went Stanford also. And his name is Xie Jia Ling. He graduated in 1960. And he's from the Institute of High Physics. I met him in 1977. I helped them build the first machine in China. Eventually, built it, and a few years ago, he got the highest prize Chinese ever given to two scientists. He's one of the two. So I'm really honored. He's 93. I went to visit him last year. And I told him I want to call this lab MJL ID Lab. Is that OK? And he signed the paper and said OK. But the name has been changed. And his wife doesn't want me to use his name anyway, so changing the name is fine. OK, so that's, uh, that's the president of China, by the way, standing there giving, the, giving him the uh, former president. Very honorable, very proud to know him. Stanford person. Uh, OK, then, of course, you can see Bert Richter. He was my thesis advisor. And he, um, he was uh, gotten the highest prize in the US uh, last year. And President Obama gave him the prize that was you can see a hang there. And he did all that just because he's thinking out of the box. All the machine at Slack, except the first and last, was all created by Bird, by thinking out of the box. So I'm honored to, uh, to give you this story of my life. And I hope this will inspire you. And uh, maybe you could do something uh, to do with optimization. If you have big data you'd like to analyze, please get hold of me. You got my email in the first on this PowerPoint. And uh, I hope that uh, you have fun with uh, doing whatever you do. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>